Now, as we continue studying and thinking about forces, there are a few that are very, very common that we're really going to need to be familiar with, a few common classes of forces. One of the most prevalent forces that we'll encounter is something called the normal force. And this is a contact force that is perpendicular to a surface. We can think about it in terms of a box. So we have a box and a box is sitting on the floor. We have forces acting on this box. We have gravity pulling it down. And that's going to be the weight. That's going to be equal to m times g. But then we have the floor pushing back up. That's what the normal force is. It's the equal and opposite force that's pushing right back. And it is normal to the surface that you're sitting on. So this is a right angle right there. If we were to write out Newton's laws for this, sum of forces, and we have only in the y direction going on here, nothing happening in x, we have the normal force pointing up minus the weight pointing down. That's going to be equal to the mass times whatever acceleration we have in the y direction. And if we're just sitting still, then this acceleration in the y direction is going to be zero. So in this case of, of something just sitting there, the normal force minus the weight is going to be equal to zero. So the normal force is equal to w, and the normal is just equal to mass times gravity, is equal to the gravitational force. So it's that equal and opposite force that we get from Newton's third law. Where things get a little confusing is when we have things happening on inclines. So when we put things on angles. Right. Most things in the world are not sitting just uh, nice and cleanly. We have angles going on. So we have an incline here at an angle of theta. And then we have a box sitting on this incline. Now if I were to draw the normal force here, we need to make sure that we're perpendicular to the surface. So the normal force that's acting here is going kind of off at this angle. So that's my normal force. But that's not acting in the nice little orthogonal kind of coordinate system that we're used to. Right? We're used to drawing our reference frames, and we see things happening in x and y, where x is left and right, and y is up and down. So what we need to do in these kinds of problems, and this is the approach I'll follow, is we're going to take our coordinate system, and we're going to rotate it. We're going to rotate it through by some angle. So now we're imagining that anything that's moving along this incline is the x direction, and anything perpendicular to the incline is in the y direction. So again, anything along this incline, that's the x direction, and anything perpendicular to the incline, that's going to be my y direction. Okay, so where this gets confusing, where this gets a little bit weird, is in thinking about what happens with gravity in this case. So gravity is going to act on this thing, but gravity doesn't care about this incline. Gravity always acts straight down. So now gravity is acting at an angle. We have the weight acting straight down. So because this is now acting at an angle, and what sometimes helps students is actually literally turning the sheet of paper so that the normal is pointing up and down. So what I want to do is I want to take this normal vector and I want to figure out what pieces of w are going in the directions that we've defined as being x and y now. So I need to project these. So if I imagine going perpendicular to the surface, perpendicular to this incline, I could extend this w so that it's going perpendicular downwards. And that might be some weight in my new y direction. And then I can imagine also that I could take this vector, take this vector w, and I want to figure out how much of w would be going along this incline. So I can take right at the tip of this vector, of this w, and I can extend a little line backwards. And I want to make sure that line is parallel to the slope. And that's going to give me a wx. And we can get rid of these extra little dots that we have. And we should be able to see a right triangle here. Right, can we see this? We have the w. That's the weight. And we have the wy, which is the y piece. And we have the wx, which is the x piece. 
And then the only key here is to figure out what's the angle. How does theta come into play? Theta is this angle right up here. We can solve that using trigonometry, using geometry from, from high school, or we could just try to commit that to memory. So what does this look like? What does the sum of forces look like in this case? Well, we have the x direction and the y direction now. We have angles. So sum of forces in the x direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the x direction. And I need to see what forces are acting in the x direction. It looks to me like the new x direction, things acting along this incline, there's only one force, that's Wx. So I have Wx is equal to the mass times acceleration in the x direction. And in this case, Wx is going to be equal to W. And now my theta and this is not what we've normally been seeing, but again, we go back to our picture, always look at your picture, and there's my theta. My Wx is on the opposite side of that triangle. So this is not cosine, this is going to be W times sine of theta is equal to mass times acceleration in the X. And we should be able to see that from that triangle that we have. And we could do the same thing in the Y direction. Sum of forces in the Y direction is mass times acceleration in the Y the forces that I have acting in the y direction. So what's going up perpendicular to this incline? The normal force. So I have the normal force, and then what things are acting down? What's acting down perpendicular to the incline? That's my wy. So that's normal minus my wy, and that's going to be equal to the mass times acceleration in the y direction. So in this triangle, I notice I have my theta, and my wy is right next to it. So since that's adjacent, I know that it's cosine. So this has to be n minus w times cosine of theta. And that's equal to mass times acceleration in the y. If we assume that none of these things are moving, they're sitting still. So we have w sine theta. If there's no acceleration in the x direction. That's just equal to 0, and it kind of goes away. Then for the y direction, we have normal minus w cosine of theta equal to 0 if this acceleration is equal to 0, if we're not moving. So the normal force in the y direction is going to be w cosine of theta. And the normal would be equal to m times g times cosine of your angle. So the key here is this triangle that we draw. We draw the weight going down, and then we break components out. A component of weight in the y direction, and a component of weight in the x direction. What other kinds of forces exist out there in addition to the normal force? Well, we've got tension forces. Tension, that feeling that you get when you uh, have no idea what I just talked about in the lecture, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a force from a flexible connection. So this is a force in something like uh, a rope or a cable. So you can see a picture of this. Let's say I have a box and it's hanging from a wire. So there are forces acting on this. We have some weight pulling it down. And then we also have a force inside of this rope, inside of this wire, whatever's holding this up. We have a force going up. That's going to be equal to the tension. And we can use Newton's third law to see tension minus weight is equal to the total mass times acceleration of this. We'll assume our box isn't moving, so this is equal to 0. And tension is equal to weight. Another force we are interested in, we have a frictional force. Friction is a force that opposes motion. And this force is so important, we have a whole chapter dedicated to talking about friction. And then lastly, we have something called a spring force. And a spring force is exactly what it sounds like. It's a force due to a spring, not the force due to that season that comes right before summer. We have an equation for the spring force. The force is equal to negative k times x. And this negative tells you that it's a restoring force. So it tends to pull you back to where you were previously. So we can draw a couple examples of this. Let's draw a little wall, and let's draw a spring. 
and a box on the end of that spring. And we're going to draw three different representations of this. So in this picture, these boxes are all the same. It's all the same box, all the same spring. And we have some rest position. So this is where the spring normally wants to be. And occasionally, we compress this spring. We compress this box down a little bit. That x is the compression. And if we look at the force that we're going to get from this, the compression here is negative. So the force will be positive because this negative will cancel. So if we take the box and put it at this position, the spring is going to be compressed and it's going to want to restore the box back to, to this rest value. Opposite to that, we can stretch this spring some distance x. And this is going to be x is going to be stretching. So x is going to be positive. So your force is going to be negative. That means that the force is going to push it back. And it's going to try to get back again to this rest position. So you can see this with springs, uh, slinkies, any kind of spring force. So the kinds of things that you need to do with these force kinds of questions and solving force kinds of queries is to really get good at drawing free body diagrams. Right. These are the diagrams where you label all forces and all the directions that the forces are going. And you got different pictures depending on the different situations. So when you're drawing your free body diagram, what you want to do is, is label all the forces. And you'll often think of objects as just being small little points in these free body diagrams. F often in dealing with forces, you'll have different objects. And what you want to do is draw a different diagram for each object. And you want to make sure that you draw these diagrams kind of big. You're going to use up a lot of paper. So don't try to cram these pictures into small little spaces. You will get massively confused if you do. And then in the situations where you have motion, you want to include that motion in your picture, but you want to kind of include it outside of it representing a force. So you want to make sure that you don't confuse motion with forces. So what were some examples that we saw of this? Well, we saw we have the free body diagram for the box, the two boxes sitting here. We had an outside force acting, pushing it, and we'd have additional forces acting here, right? We'd have a force on box one, which we'd call the weight of box one. And we'd also have the weight of box two. And we'd have a force of box one acting on box two and the equal and opposite force of box two acting back on box one. And we'd also have a normal force, the normal force due to box one and we'd have the normal force due to box two. So that would be a free body diagram for two boxes just sitting on a table. And this is how we draw it all in one figure, or we could draw it in two different figures, in two different diagrams, separate diagrams for each box. So let's say we have box one. I can denote what all the forces are acting on box one. I have the force right here on box one pushing it over to the right. I have the force of box two on box one pushing it over to the left. I have the weight of box one pushing it down and I have the normal for box one pushing up. Then for box two if I look at the forces directly acting on box two I have a few different ones acting here. I notice that I have force of box one acting on box two my force F that is acting on box number one, it's acting entirely on box number one. It's not actually pushing or touching box number two. So I don't include that here. There's no force F acting on box two. And I have the normal acting up and I have the weight acting down. So these would be two different versions of a free body diagram that we could use. One for separating them out explicitly box one and box two, or one for drawing them all together. 
and then the other diagram that we want to get really good at and we're going to you're going to you're going to need to practice this you need to do some problems involving this and look at some samples in the book is this rotation along an axis so here we have a triangle we have an inclined plane that's inclined at an angle theta and i have a box that's sitting on this incline the force is acting on this gravity is going to act straight down my weight goes down and the way you're going to want to do these typically is to rotate your coordinate system so you don't want to have x and y going up and down and left and right you want to spin this so imagine spinning this so that your x and y are now along the incline and perpendicular to the incline normal is acting perpendicular to the surface and then we can take this w this weight that I have and I can break it into components that are rotated along this new coordinate grid along this new coordinate system so I can do that by imagining taking the tip right there at the end of this W and draw a line that goes straight back and is parallel to my slope so these two lines are got have to be parallel uh, the slope and the weight extension kind of uh, projection of my vector going backwards and then to figure out where this green dotted line actually ends I would take my normal force my normal vector and I extend that one backwards a little bit and I keep extending and then wherever these intersect that's the end point for these dotted lines so I can get rid of the extra pieces that aren't in there and now I've created the projections of these vectors I have a W in the Y direction my new Y direction and I have a W in the X direction and the last key point is where this theta goes so this theta always will go way up here the line between your weight that's going down and the perpendicular kind of extension of the normal force going down as well so there's your theta and then we can write down all the trig functions for this wonderful triangle we can do there's my theta if I want the sine of this theta that's the opposite side WX all divided by the hypotenuse which is W which is where I find that WX is equal to W sine theta and I can find the cosine of theta for this triangle here's my theta my side that is closest to this theta that is adjacent has to be that wy divided by the hypotenuse of w so wy is equal to w cosine theta and this is going to be a very popular kind of problem uh, a popular kind of situation that you'll need to be able to draw out and solve